probably the most um, the thing that differentiates innovation strategy from general st strategic management. Those who have done um, business management studies or something like that, or done short courses with their employer on strategic management. Um, it differs in quite a lot of respects, but the main difference between innovation strategy, which we're talking about in today's session, and conventional strategic management, which I believe is still an option for some of you in, in the second uh, teaching block in January, is how we deal with uncertainty. Yeah, if you, thought, if you rewind right back to that first session, we said that one of the inherent factors in managing innovation is how we identify different sources of uncertainty and how we try to mitigate or manage it. Okay, so we acknowledge it exists and try to understand it better and how we deal with it. A lot of conventional strategic management just ignores it. Yeah, because it comes out of business policy, planning, that type of mentality. Okay, and that might be fine when nothing's changing and you don't want to change anything, but it doesn't work in terms of innovation strategy. So one of the big differences or divergences between strategic management, which you may have been exposed to, and innovation strategy, what we're talking about now, is how we deal with uncertainty. Okay? Okay. Flowing from that, having tried to identify what are the sources, types of uncertainty, um, then we start to consider, well, in terms of innovation strategy, how does it influence the types of innovation, particularly the direction, I'll talk about what we mean by that later, of innovation pursued. So we spoke a bit in week one about different types and degrees of innovation, incremental, radical, didn't spend too much time in disruptive, and also different types, you know, the four Ps and other frameworks that are available. Um, and we're also talking today about the direction of innovation. So if you like, almost by definition, that's the nuts and bolts of what flows from that. That's what innovation strategy is about. What types of innovation and what direction are we heading in terms of that, okay? And then finally, but probably, if you like, in some ways, the most important aspect is if we look at if we look at innovation research and practice, the core topic, and I'll show you some uh, evidence later. The core topic is um, that of capabilities, which is sometimes called other things: resource-based view, competencies. And we'll talk about the language later on, but that's not important. Okay. But if you look at the core body of innovation strategy, both research and practice, what it's really talking about is what are capabilities, how do they work, how do they influence strategy. Okay, so they're the three, I believe, the three big differences between conventional strategic management, which is fine. You know, if you're in a relatively stable environment with a well-understood business and there's no great need to innovate, that's fine. But we're saying the purpose of innovation strategy, it's not, it just doesn't work. You know, that sort of planning approach just does not work. Okay, and these are the three big differences. And we'll sort of briefly discuss each of these um, along the way. Okay. So the first one, which is the one where it starts to diverge from the conventional, is how we deal with uh, changes in the environment. Mainly uncertainty, but also complexity. More things happening, which is not the same thing, okay? But uncertainty is the, the main big deal. And there are different ways of doing that. Different organisations, not just companies, different organisations will respond to external if you're like threats, to use that terminology, a lot of you in the seminar said, you know, let's do a SWOT or a PEST and stuff like that, and that's fine, and that comes mainly from the sort of standard strategy stuff, but it doesn't really go far enough because organisations will often respond differently to the same perceived threat. Okay? And we're going to argue later on one of the reasons for that is going to fast forward in is that notion of capabilities, is they have different capabilities. Okay, so therefore they see what's happening in a different light, and so they respond differently. So we're not suggesting that you have some shock in the environment and then you have some optimum response. We're arguing that how companies perceive and react to those environmental uncertainties is fundamentally different, even in the same sector, even threatened by the same external factors. Okay, so there's not a sort of one best strategy here. So again, that's a big difference between strategic management. We are often trying to optimise a strategic move. Okay, so uh, example, and there are hundreds of, literally hundreds of examples. Um, Kodak, until recently an American company. Fuji, Japanese company, by contrast. For about 60, 70 years, they were direct competitors. Yeah, Kodak, well, it doesn't really exist other than the brand name now, but it's over 100 years old, roughly. 
and Fuji is more recent, about 70, 80 years old. But for about 70 of those years, they overlapped, and they basically competed with each other. Yeah, and they competed with each other primarily in the market for um, photographic film. You may not remember what that is unless you're a budding photographer, but basically, you know, chemical film, okay, that reacts to light and you get it developed, all that old stuff, yeah, that only the professionals do now. So, for many, many decades, they were direct competitors, okay, they competed on brand, on price, on quality, a whole range of metrics, yeah, sounds good. When faced with potential disruption, I don't like that term, and we'll talk about it later, maybe today, but maybe in another session, but when faced with disruption, mainly from changes in the external environment, okay, and these are often characterised as changes only in technology, but they weren't only changes in technology, there were also changes in how images were used, okay, moving more towards sort of portable and instant responses rather than um, uh, more conventional devices. But the fundamental change, you probably guess, was from what used to be called wet chemistry in the dark, the chemical process, through to basically an electronic one and then more recently a digital one. Okay? Fundamental shift in how you image, but also how images are generated and consumed. Okay? So a big shift or disruption in the internal environment. Okay, 60, 70 years, these guys battled it out on the basis of brand and cost and quality and everyone had their favourite products and such like. But faced with that external, if you like, disruption, they had very different strategic responses. And that's the point. And the point is not that one was better than the other, but they were different. And the reason they were different, we're going to argue, is that one, in this case Kodak, tended to define its strategy in terms of its current products and markets. And we're going to argue that's often fatal, literally, for a company. Yeah, so we're arguing one of these companies define themselves in terms of their current markets and products. And then the strategy was how do we continue to serve them and, fr and thrive. So Kodak was saying here's a difference, a technological difference in how we create images and like, latterly how we share images. So how do we respond to that? Because we're a digital com we're an image company, and we need to move from chemistry basically to electronics and to digital imaging, and that was their strategy. Yeah, what we do is help people create images, and how could we do that given this change in technology? And that was their strategy. Yeah. It didn't work, but that's not the lesson today. Okay, it was fatal, but that's not the lesson. The lesson was, if you define it in terms of your end products and markets, it's problematic. Because if they're threatened, then the organisation is threatened quite deeply. Okay? Look at the opposite example, which happens to be slightly more successful at the moment, but that's not the point, that's not the lesson. But if you define what you do in terms of, if you like, how you do it, what we're going to call capabilities, then it opens up a range of different potential strategies. Because you're no longer locked into your existing product or markets, which by definition are often threatened. Okay? So, what we're trying to illustrate here is not one worked and one didn't, although that is the case, but when you tend to frame your strategy in terms of your existing products and services, it's self-limiting and often fatal, okay? Because if they're threatened, the organisation's survival is threatened. If you frame it in terms of what are our capabilities, and we'll define those later, what can we do that others can't do so well, it opens up a wider range of potential strategies, particularly innovation strategies. So for, rather than saying, we need to move from chemistry to digital imaging, which is Kodak's approach. What was the problem with that approach? There are at least two big problems with that strategy. I just said the lesson isn't good or bad, but there is some element of that. What's the problem if you were Kodak to say, we're going to shift from chemical film to digital imaging, which is exactly what they said, and that's exactly what they did. Made huge investments. To they didn't have experience in new uh, <coughs> Yep, certainly it didn't have the sort of 100-year accumulated experience that they had in chemistry and producing um, film, and don't underestimate experience. What they tried to do to come, overcome that, which is a, a legitimate strategic response, was to massively hire software and hardware electronic engineers. Okay? And for one period, they had many patents as well in that area. So they were, in some ways, reacting quite rationally. Yeah? Technology shifted. We still have the brand, we still understand the markets, which they didn't. Yeah, and what we need to do is build up that expertise. So that's certainly one of their um, challenges, if you like, which is quite a generic one. And what was, the, what was another challenge for that Kodak strategy? Yeah. 
Anyone? So one was trying to develop those, well, not really capabilities, but those skills and technological knowledge. The other one was, by defining in terms of products and markets, you suddenly had a whole raft of very well-endowed competitors. Because at that point in time, it was basically Kodak, at least globally, Kodak versus Fuji. There are other players in specialist markets, yeah? But basically, it was those two players. And they knew them, and they coexisted in some markets. In some markets, one dominated, in some others, others dominated. And that was relatively stable for six or seven decades. Suddenly, in addition to trying to get all that te technical knowledge, you're also confronted by dozens and dozens of electronics companies that suddenly said, we have a new market. Yeah, digital imaging. Okay, and we already have a lot of this expertise. We've got to learn a bit about the markets and that. So suddenly you had a whole raft of new competitors who were very well endowed, particularly in the new technologies. And that's quite challenging as well. So by narrowly defining the, the, the uh, strategy, you opened yourself up to lots more competition, yeah, which you then had to spend lots and lots of money on recruiting and building up R&D and patents in those areas. So it's a very challenging response, but very common response. Yeah if you define your strategy in terms of your current products and markets. It's not unique to Kodak, okay? You see it in automobiles today with electric vehicles, completely misreading what the market's doing. Okay, flip over Fuji, and the lesson isn't Fuji was right. Fuji's still struggling, but it still survives, okay? Some bits better than the other. By looking at what we're gonna call capabilities, it was able to then have a wider range of potential innovation strategies with fewer competitors in those markets. So in the language of Blue Ocean, which we briefly discuss in seminars, and we discuss in a moment, it was not necessarily uncontested, there were competitors, but if you like, it was less contested. There were fewer competitors and they weren't as powerful. Okay, so it went into things like, for example, um, uh, skincare. And you think in skincare, from, from, yeah, from photography, what's happening here? But if you define it in terms of capability, it makes perfect sense. It's about thin films, it's about optics, about transmission, reflection, yeah? And you see there's a lot of the basic technology carries over. It's a whole new, potentially new market that isn't currently threatened by digital imaging, yeah? So you see, you get a wider range, and more importantly, a different range of potential future strategies. So we're gonna argue, take care. You know, it's more about identifying what are your distinctive, what we're gonna call capabilities in a moment, and we define those, versus what markets do we currently find ourselves in, which is a transient thing. Yeah? It might be five or six decades, it might be several months, yeah? but often it's transient, so we need to step away from that and say, what makes this distinctive? What can we do that others can't do so well? Okay? And where else could we apply that? So in the language of the four Ps, that would be more like a sort of positioning innovation. Okay? So the capabilities are relatively stable, but you apply them in a whole different area. Okay. End of sermon, end of that sermon anyway. Okay, so we saw this slide I think in week one or week two, but the point being is what we're talking about today makes a difference. So we're talking about innovation strategy and depending on how you measure that, and we'll have some ways of measuring particularly capabilities later on, depending on how you measure it, it's round about half of the um, explained performance variance, yeah? So if you do these big regressions, you get about half of it is about strategy, if you like, what you do, and the rest is other things, but how you do, how well you do it, and how, how many competitors and such like. Okay, so it's a big chunk. If you like doing the right things or being in the right sort of markets and businesses, it's a big deal. And that's largely down to strategy. And we're going to argue if you just define it in terms of products and markets, it's a temporary advantage at most. Yeah? So you need to think beyond that about these, what we're going to call these sort of deep capabilities. And hopefully give some more examples. And the uncertainty is there. Yeah? Go back to week one. It's still there. We need to figure out what are the sources of uncertainty. Is it market? Is it technology? Is it regulatory? And how much of that can we anticipate? How much can we mitigate? You know, spread? And how much can we manage in some way? Yeah? Reduce. Okay.